Good morning, church. Welcome once again to Christ Culture. We love you. We appreciate you. Uh, Tertia and I, we are not in service this morning, but we're on our way to Muscle Bay. Uh, we'll see you next week again. Uh, we're just going on a ministry trip. And we want to welcome our online community as well. And we also want to welcome our family from Namibia. We, we can't wait to be with you guys soon. We love you. We appreciate it. Remember to go tell someone, tell somebody. I don't know about you, but Sunday was an awesome on-the-fire service. Uh, don't forget to bring a friend, tell a family, go and tell somebody uh, so that we can share this goodness of our Heavenly Father wherever we go. In the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm so excited about this series. I know we're like part nine already, and I'm still excited. Uh, I'll be finishing the series up very soon. Uh, I think there's about three or four still left before we conclude in the series. But I, the reason why I'm spending a bit of time on the series is I'm going a bit slow because I know there's some new faces that has been joining us over the last few weeks. And I really don't want uh, the, the new people who have joined us to get lost. So uh, like I said last week, I'm taking a bit of identity heist. And I'm taking a bit of, of, of the current uh, uh, message where we're talking about understanding grace, the power of the gospel. I'm kind of meshing it a bit so that we don't get lost. So last week I briefly touched on spirit, soul, and body. And I spoke about you are what you think. We, a few weeks ago we spoke about renewing your mom. We spoke about being freed in sin and so forth. And we've also established the different natures that, we, that, 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 that is available we also said that if you want to stand upon your own merits, your own self-righteousness, then you need to continue in the sin nature. And when we became, uh, we, we not became born, but, but when we were born, whichever year you were born, when we were born, we were born into sin because of Adam. Romans 5, 16 to uh, 18 and 20 says, by one man's disobedience, we all were made uh, uh, wrong, basically. We all became sinners. But because of another man's obedience, who is Jesus, we all were made right uh, through Jesus. So for those who are in Christ, you have been made right. God is no longer mad at you. God is no longer angry at you. He's crazy about you. He loves you. I've also said a couple of weeks ago or months ago, I always say this, that if he had a free shirt, your photo would be on it. If he had a pedal still, then your photo would be on it as well. If he, if he had a wallet, your photo would be in it because he's crazy about you. He's a good, good father. It is not messages of how that, of how that leads you to repentance. The Bible says it's a goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And repentance doesn't only mean confessing of sins, but it simply means a change of heart, a change of mind. You have gone down the wrong uh, path, but now you have changed your mind to go down the right path. Basically, exchanging the broad road for the narrow road. Basically, exchanging your self-righteousness for His righteousness. And then change, we, we say this, uh, the, this gospel doesn't change you. It only brings the revelation of the exchange that has taken place. So this week I want to continue on our series in part 9 where we speak about your new nature. And last week we made reference to Romans 7, 1 to 4. Having made all before mentioned points, Paul began speaking to Christians who used to be under the old Jewish law. Believers who were very aware of God's standard of performance and judgment on sin. In Romans chapter 7 from verse 1 to 4 says, Or oh, do you not know, brethren? For I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. In verse 2 it says, For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. In verse 3 it says, Though then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. So that she is no longer an adulteress. Though she has married another man. In verse 4 it says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Now, the thing is, uh, we often say we are, are saved by grace, but often we mix it with the law. It's like me saying, uh, uh, we are married to Christ, but we're still sleeping with the law. 
And often in the churches, we mix the gospel between law and grace. Last week, I established that if you want to be under the law, be sure to keep the Levitical laws all by yourself. If you want to live under yourself, righteous or under the law that has been given, we've established that the law is perfect. The law is like a schoolmaster. The law is basically telling us it, it is so perfect, it is actually pointing us to our sinful nature. And because of the sinful nature, we now realize that we cannot hold the law by ourselves and we need a savior. So Paul was actually drawing a comparison from the natural realm. It is a parable like the one Jesus taught. Once a couple is married, the spouse can't go out and have an intimate relationship with another person. They are bound by law to that mate or each other. If the mate's spouse dies, then the marriage relationship is over and they are free to marry again. That's the point Paul was trying to make. So basically, if you are married to Christ, you are free from the law. The law has no longer dominion over you. You have fulfilled the law through Christ. The Bible said that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the law. So for us that are in Christ, we have fulfilled the law with Christ. You are made up of spirit, soul, and body. The body is what you see in the mirror. Your soul is your intellectual emotions, will, and personality. Your spirit is your inner man. You can learn more about this from our uh, Identity High series where we go in detail about spirit, soul, and body. Most people aren't able to discern between what's spirit and what's flesh, what is body and what is soul. Sometimes people think all of the things act the same, but the moment you became born again, your spirit was made perfect, just as Jesus is. Now, when you became born again, your body didn't change. If you were skinny, you would most likely still be skinny. If you like chocolate, you will most likely still like chocolate. It, the thing that changed was the spirit, and the soul has to draw from the spirit, man, and, and, and through the, the soulish realm, you will then pour into the natural. So the revelation has been in the spirit. So the gap between revelation and manifestation is right believing. Now the soul is the one that needs to open up the tap as wide as possible. The wider the tap is, the more the spirit, the life of the spirit will start to flow into the natural. But you can learn more about that in, in, in our Identity High series. You can't feel the spirit. In John chapter 3 from verse 5 to 6 says, Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. In verse 6 it says that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. We use that terminology by technically, uh, you can't physically sense the Spirit. You, uh, what you feel is when your soul gets into faith and the effects that it has. Now, basically, I'm just giving you a summary of our Identity High series. So, basically, what happens is, 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 is your sinful nature cannot impact the condition of your spirit. Your spirit is perfect, is well, and is just as Jesus is. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that now resides on the inside of you. Now, the spiritual things can impact your, your physical life. But the only way your physical life can be impacted by the Spirit is when the soul starts to lean to the Spirit. And, and I always use this terminology that, that two is better than one. If the Spirit and the soul gangs up, the, the flesh has to submit. I've said in Identity High that, that your spirit cannot be born, um, not your spirit, your flesh cannot be born again. Your flesh will always want to sin. Your flesh will always want to fornicate. Your, your flesh will always want to tell lies or steal or kill and to destroy and to assassinate characters. But the only way to get that out of your life is to lean to the spirit and the spiritual things. The more you lean to the spirit, the more the soul and the spirit gangs up against the flesh. The flesh will no longer, the thorn that Paul was talking about in the flesh will no longer dominate your life. A few weeks ago, we spoke about freed in sin. If you receive this free gift, you are free from sin. So you need to lean to the Spirit so that you, so, 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 so the flesh can be submissive, basically, to the things of God. But let's look at the other part of the picture. If, if, if the soul is, is ganged up with the flesh, 
Of course, you would want to start watching movies you should not be watching. Of course, you'll be listening to music that you not should be listening to music. So basically, Romans uh, uh, 5, 16 to 20 is basically being played out. Deuteronomy 13, 19 is also being played out. Behold, I place before you life and death. The flesh is living a deadly life. The spirit is living a life of abundance. Behold, I place the spiritual things life before you. And I've placed death before you choose life. A few weeks ago, or about a week ago, I said to somebody, you cannot be realistic and have faith at the same time. Many Christians still believe in being realistic. I'm telling you, you cannot be realistic because realistic means you're living by the flesh. You're living by your five senses. You're living by the thoughts and, and your emotions. You are living by your bank balance. You are living by what you can see. You are living by the sight, by the feel, the emotions, and the five senses. But if you live by faith, you, you, because remember, faith operates without sight. Faith is something that you're trusting God. You cannot see it, but you know it's done. It is not becoming, it is being, is existing, is being in Christ. Is understanding the same promises and the abundance that God has made available to you more than 2,000 years ago. So behold, I place before you life and death. But Jesus says, but God says, choose life. Again, in Romans 5, 20, it speaks about by one man's disobedience, we all became sinners. So the flesh will reign in your life. But because of another man's obedience, who is Jesus, we were made right. So I'm, I'm encouraging you to choose life today. Choose the spirit. In Luke 1, 4, uh, 46 to 47 says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. You don't wait on the Holy Spirit to make you speak in tongues. You talk in tongues and the Holy Spirit gives you the utterance. In 1 Corinthians 14 verse 14 says, For, I, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, when you speak in tongues, you don't understand naturally what's going on because the physical things does not understand the spiritual things. That's why when you pray in tongues, your mind sometimes wonder because you cannot figure it out. So when you speak in tongues, it is speaking directly. It, it connects you directly, almost like a presidential line, a contour directly with the king of kings. Nobody can interfere. I mean, for years we, we taught when we pray in tongues and we don't feel the move of God. Maybe, maybe there's a few spiritual realms blocking it. But the thing is, for you that are in Christ, you have a direct line to the president. His name is Jesus. So nothing that you say or do will be interrupted by any spiritual realm because you are a son, a prince, a king, whatever you the king, a princess of the most high God. You have direct contact, contact with the king of kings. In Acts chapter 2 verse 4, says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So for those of you that want to speak in tongues, you need to step out in faith and start speaking in tongues. But in a few moments, you will see the utterance of the Holy Spirit come upon you. Like we saw last week, I spoke in a new tongue that I've never spoken before. I always say to, to Tertia, I always say to Tertia as a pastor, sometimes to the gift of prophecies on my life. I'm not a prophet, but I, I operate in the gifting of prophecy. But, but it, it takes a boldness, it takes an obedience for me to, to, to speak what, what, what I believe God is telling me. And sometimes I will look at somebody, but I, don't, I have no clue what God wants me to say to that person. He will show me the person's face. And the moment when I step out, the utterance of the Holy Spirit starts to show me pictures. It starts to show, I start hearing uh, His voice and He started to give me instruction. So again, obedience is better than sacrifice. Now imagine I did not uh, uh, rest in his confidence. If I didn't rest in his confidence, the gift of prophecy will not increase on my life. If I don't rest in his confidence or choose life for this matter, then the utterance of the Holy Spirit will not work through me. Yourself, what you call the real you, is your soul. So we spoke about the spirit right now. We're going to move to the soul. In Paul's comparison in Romans 7, 1 to 4, that self is the woman in the marriage. Again, in Romans 7, 1 to 4, it says, Oh, do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, 
that the law has dominion over the over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. So that she is no adulteress, through, uh, though she married another man. In verse 4 it says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, which is grace now, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. The reason why yourself did the things it did before you were born again was because it was married to a corrupt old man. Your sin nature was married to the law. Now the law is so perfect. The law is so perfect. The law is perfect in pointing out your sin. The law cannot save you. The law, we, we needed the law to, to show us that we needed a savior. When Jesus came and died for you, he took your old man, your sin nature, into himself. In Romans chapter 6 from verse 3 it says, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? You are dead in him. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. Somehow Jesus was able to take your sin, not your individual sin only, but your nature of sin. Your old man, your old thinking, your own old life. And took it upon himself when he died. And an exchange took place more than 2,000 years ago. He took your poverty and gave you his riches. He took your sickness and gave him your health. He took your sadness and gave you happiness, joy and peace, laughter and long suffering. This freed you up to be married to someone else. So now you are no longer a slave to sin. But you are now married to grace. In Romans chapter 7 verse 4 it says, Therefore my brethren, brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So if you want to bear fruit, you cannot be married to the law because you will not bear fruit. You need to be married to Christ, grace, the gospel, the power of the gospel. Although it is true that we are the bride of Christ and married to Him. In context, this is referring to ourselves, our souls, being married to our new nature, our born again spirits. Through Jesus, that old nature you were married to died and now you have a brand new nature. Resurrected nature on the inside of you that you married into. This new nature can now be your master the way your old nature used to be. You may still feel the effects of the old nature, the flesh. Remember the flesh, the law in you because he taught you how to think and act. But the truth is you have a new husband. You've been made new. All that you need to do is change your mind and accept this free gift. All you need to do is, 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 is renew your thinking. Change the old wineskins and get new wineskins for this new wine. In Proverbs 23 verse 7 it says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You have to get it on the inside before you get it. On the outside, so the inside, the spiritual things, the, 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 the soulish realm need to get the spiritual things before you will see it in the natural things. Everything you receive from God comes on the inside first. We've been set free from sin.
But many of us aren't free because we don't know what happened to us. We know what, what, what happened to Jesus on Calvary. But many Christians don't know what that meant for us. Often we are told that we are saved by grace. But sometimes it gets mixed with the performance law gospel. Married to Christ and sleeping with the law. But God has come to clear this up in Romans 7. Paul uh, writes it beautifully in Romans 7 compar comparing it to a married relationship. You are now no longer under the law, but you are under grace. We are still serving the old master. This is why sin keeps on dominating in our lives. This is the comparison Paul was making. Before we were born again, our sin nature strengthened by the law, motivated and compelled us to do sinful actions. In Romans chapter 7 verse 5 it says, For when we were in the flesh... The sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. So when you lean to the flesh, to, the, to death, or choose death, then the sinful natures will start to rise and give birth into your life. But if you lean to the abundance, the, the unmerited favor, grace of God, the spiritual things, then His goodness will start to manifest in your life. Remembering that sin here, as in most of Romans, is a noun in the original Greek. We can better understand what Paul was saying. The law governed and ruled our old sin nature. So in Romans chapter 7 from verse 6 it says, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So the letter talking about the law, the scrolls, the Levitical law, the Ten Commandments, the comma, the punctuations I've been talking about. The law was given only for people with a sin nature. So if you don't want Christ, remember you are living by the law. And if you die today, you will be judged by the law. But for those who are in Christ, they will no longer be judged by the letter of the law, but they will be judged by Jesus Christ himself. Grace, the power of the gospel. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 from verse 9, it says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but the lawness and the ups, uh, uh, so, so, what a so, sobernate, <laughs> I can't even get to this word, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers and uh, manslayers, or layers, yeah, slayers. So basically what Jesus did when he came, he gave law to those who needed law, and he gave grace to those who needed grace. This is why he reasoned with the, with, with, with the Pharisees and the priests and the religious leaders as within law thinking. He is telling them, if you are, are wanting to live by the law, just remember you will die by the law. And then those who needed the, 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 the grace of God, he gave them grace. And, 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 and he gave them what, what, what the unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor is. The law governed our old man, but it doesn't govern our new man. There is no law against our new nature because it does not have any uh, uh, propensity or ability to sin. In Galatians chapter 5 from verse 24 to 20, uh, 22 to verse 20, 24 it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. In verse 24, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I promise you've never seen that scripture in that life before. What grace has made available, my faith can take. In Romans chapter 7 from verse 5 to 7, it says, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law, we're at work in our members to bear fruit to death. In verse 6 it says, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what were 
uh, held by now were free from the law because our sin nature is dead. I just added that in. So that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. In verse 7 says, But shall we say then, it uh, is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. And because the law cannot point me to Christ, it only points me to my sin. It makes me realize I need a savior. And because I cannot keep the law, the letter of the law over myself, I, I'm laying my self-righteousness down and, I, and I'm accepting or receiving, I don't like the word accept, but receiving this free gift of salvation. You can only lust for something that's forbidden. In Romans chapter 7 verse 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the Lord had said, you shall not covet. Lust is always referred to an illicit, illegal manner. You never have lust until somebody puts a restriction on you. It just remind me about a parents who often tell the kids, no, you cannot have this particular cookie in this jar. What would a kid want to do? They just want to put their hands in the cookie jar <laughs> because they were restricted from them. I remember when, I, when we used to do camps, uh, youth camps back in the day, uh, the, the youth actually had more fun when we actually put laws in place. If there was no law, there was no fun that evening, basically. So if you tell the, the, the youth, you need to be lights out by 10 o'clock, guess what they're going to do? They're going to not have lights out by 10 o'clock because there's law in place. The same way, uh, I, know, I know in Germany, for instance, I know that Germany has no particular road speed limits as well. But I've heard testimonies of people saying, uh, uh, e even though you're allowed to drive about any uh, speed on the highways in Germany, you will automatically start governing yourself and say, that, that's too fast. But the sooner you put the law on somebody, the do's and the don'ts, guess what do they want to do? They want to do the don'ts, right? If I go back to husband and wife, sometimes when a wife tells her husband, you need to put the dirt out, guess what he's doing? He's not going to put the dirt out, he's going to actually procrastinate, right? So I want to tell you, the more we put laws on people, the more they will not do it. But grace is something where we govern ourselves through the grace and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So whenever you put, uh, you, you never have lust until somebody puts a restriction on you. The law was for the self-righteous religious person who was lost and did not know it. The commandment facilitated sin. In Romans chapter 7 from verse 8 it says, But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. Desire or lust basically. For apart from the law, sin was dead. The Old Testament law won't set you free from sin, but it will actually make sin dominate you or dominate in your life or reign in your life. Your sin nature did not exercise any real dominance or control un until the commandment came. That sin nature was already in all of us, but it lies dormant until the time of the law comes. Then sin revives and we die. So because we were born, uh, uh, because we were born with a sin nature, because of Adam, that sin lay dormant in our lives. It is already in our seed, in our bloodline, basically. But the minute we start to understand the law, guess what happens? We, we almost want to break the speed record, uh, speed limit. Because, 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 because of the sin and because of the law that we now understand, we want to, want to gossip. So, so, so we try to govern us according to the law. So in Romans 7, chapter 7, verse 9, it says, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. I'm just thinking of a child. The moment they, they are born, they carefree. Their faith is, is almost unlimited. They believe you when you promise things to them. But the moment they start to come to the understanding that, that sin nature starts to come alive on the inside of them, 
And guess what happens? They die until they receive Christ as a personal Savior. The law strengthens sin in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 56. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. It did not strengthen us in our battle against sin. It strengthened sin, our sin nature, in its battle against us. The law was designed to show us our corruption, our corrupt nature, and cause us to run to God crying, Help! I need a Savior. In Galatians chapter 3 from verse 23 to 24, it says, But before faith came, we were kept under God by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. In verse 24, it says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So the law was like a schoolmaster, reminding you that you need to keep the covenant of the law. And if you cannot keep the covenant law, it kind of points us to Christ. The commandment itself was perfect and holy. It is just. It, uh, the bull had to be settled. And we could not settle the bull by ourselves, but we needed a Savior called Jesus to settle the bull for us. And the bull wasn't money. It wasn't shackles or whatever you call it or, or whatever the money of the Jewish culture was. But the bull had to be a covenant of blood. Blood had to be shed. So the bull for our sin and our weaknesses, and our generational curse and our sickness had to be paid once and for all. The commandment itself was perfect and holy. But the problem was that none of us were. In Romans chapter 7 verse 10, And the commandment which was to bring life are found to bring death. Even though it could have given life if we would have kept the law in its fullness, it actually produced death. Because only one person in all of the history of mankind or whatever you want to call has ever kept the whole law and it wasn't you and me and his name was Jesus. He was the only one who could fulfill the law. And for those who are in Christ, we now have died with Christ. We have now lived with Christ and we have risen with Christ. So for us that are in Christ, we have fulfilled the law with him. In Romans chapter 7 from verse 11 to 13 it says, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. In verse 12 it says, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment, ho uh, commandment holy, and just, and good. In verse 13 it says, Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good. So the sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. It brings the knowledge of sin, condemnation and guilt. And it makes us say, I am such a sinner. I will never make it on my own. I need a savior. That is also why most Christians are so condemned and guilt ridden today. They are still trying to relate to God on the basis of their performance, their old sin nature. I have a new man on the inside now. Now I'm free from the law. Just like a woman who was treated badly in a marriage doesn't have to fear a dead husband. My old nature is gone. It's over with. Because of my new nature, my new mate, my new husband, my born again spirit, I don't have to feel guilty anymore. Let me tell you something. God is no, no longer mad at you. He has set you free. Sin, he, he, his appetite for sin and judgment has already been appeased, has already been settled on Calvary. And the bill has been paid in full by our Lord Jesus Christ Jesus. Christians should, Christians should not feel guilty or condemned anymore because that old man which the law governed is now dead, gone, and non-existence. The law is perfect and I am not. So the law and I could never get along. In Romans chapter 7 verse 14 it says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. 
sold under sin. This brings us back to Romans 7, 15, 25. Let me read it one more time. For what I'm doing, I do not understand for what I will do to do. That I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. In verse 16, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. In verse 17, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. In verse 18, it says, for I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to the world is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I would do, do I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. In verse 21 says, I find in a law that evil is present with me. The one who wills to do good. In verse 22 it says, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members horning against, a warring, sorry, a warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, rich man uh, that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. In Romans 15, 7, I mean Romans 7 verse 15, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. Paul was simply describing the inability of any of us on our own to live for God without Christ. We must have this brand new man on the inside of us, and we must let him be the one to live through us. So if you think that you can do this thing all by yourself, you are mistaken. You need a savior. You need to, to change your mind and receive this free gift of salvation, this new nature. Don't you get it? You are no longer under the law, but you are under grace. So stop living a performance-based mentality and start to renew your mind. Start to think and meditate and be carnal-minded. Like I said last week, focus on His goodness. You have been given a new nature. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the new nature that has been given to us more than 2,000 years ago. Father, I pray that you would help us to love more and more through this new nature that God had given and help us to forget the old sinful nature. Help us just uh, uh, renew our mind. Help us renew our minds and, and help us to stay focused on you. Help us to change our mind from negative thinking and, and turn it into positive and focus on your goodness. Because it is your goodness, it is this new nature that leads us to repentance. Father, we thank you for all that you have done, Father. We love you and we appreciate you. In Jesus' name, amen. See you guys next week. God bless.